Jiu Jitsu 2000 here today. I'm coming at you with another reloading video. Now this video that I'm shooting today, it's unfortunate because I haven't been able to get to this but I've had a ton of requests to do this round. 7.62 by 39. Okay, let's start as we always do. On my bench I have a bunch of things that are necessary for reloading. First and most important in my opinion is some good clear safety glasses. Now let's make sure that these are clear free of obstructions that they're not going to hinder my view on anything and let's go ahead and put them on. So I'm going to go ahead and put them on right now and then here shortly I'll talk about some of these items on the bench. Now right here of course you know right here that I'm touching this is my tumbler and I have some brass in there I'm gonna be taking brass out of there and I'm gonna be loading them today that's one thing that you're gonna need you're also gonna need some powder today we're gonna be using the IMR 4227 this is a very good ball powder you're gonna need some primers we're gonna be using federal large rifle primers you're gonna need some bullets 7.62 123 grain bullets. Let's take a look at those. These are a soft tip bullet, jacketed soft tip, soft point, I'm sorry. They have a nice little cantaloupe on them. Those are the bullets we're going to be using today. We're going to need some load data. So I'm going to be using load data out of the Lyman 49th edition. Now let's turn over real quick to the page. 7.62 by 39 Russian. In this book, you'll see some specs. You know, things like overall length, trim lengths, things like that. It'll tell you right here that you need large rifle primers. It'll tell you the diameter of the bullets if you're going to be casting them. They need to be sized. And gas checks and things like that. Now, right here, we're talking about the 123 grain jacketed saw point. IMR 4227 right that's our powder and it'll give you a started suggested load of 20 grains and it'll give you a max load of 22 grains this is the load you don't want to exceed this is the approximate velocity of the 20 grain load now let me talk about something else you notice in this book that down here you see H335 in bold and it says 30 point what is that 30.5 this bold means that is the most accurate charge that they found for this round in their testing now you see it says go up not to exceed 34.5 and then it has a little plus sign next to it that plus sign designates that that was a compressed load meaning that when they seat the bullet the bullet would be seated pushing the powder down as the bullet seats but notice it's not in bold this one is so thirty and a half grains of 335 that was the most accurate load again here's a little key down here talks about what that plus sign means that it's a compressed charge so we're going to be getting data out of this book now one thing that I like to do personally is I like to go through the book and I like to write down what cartridge I'm going to be loading, what the overall length is of the completed cartridge, what my trim length of my brass is. Now it says 1.51 to 1.52 trim. You're probably wondering about that. This right here says 1.528 trim length. You see that? 1.528. But when you come down over here, it talks about trim length. It says 1.51. So you got 1.52 up here and 1.51 down here. And so I wrote down both trim lengths. And honestly, it doesn't really matter because you're talking a very small difference here between these two. So we'll just kind of play that by ear and see where we where we come up with uh, when we get to that step. Now the bullets, Hornady, 123 grain jacketed soft point. They're .310 diameter bullets. That's very important right there and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Primers, Federal, large rifle primers, 
powder IMR 4227 20 to 22 again look right next to it 20 to 22 today I've circled 20 because that's where our 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 uh, charges are going to be 20 grains now at the bottom it says cases have been trimmed I always write that down when I trim my cases and, and we're going to go through that today so again I have all my information on a piece of paper that way I can put the book away get it away and deal with just that paper now some of the other tools this is a, a deburring tool chamfering tool I'll talk about that this is a primer pocket uh, cleaner this is just a scoop that I can scoop powder with now it's important to use some sort of scoop instead of your fingers when you're dealing with powder because you don't want to get the oils off of your hands into the powder and contaminate it. Here's a brush. We're going to just be running that through the case mouth. Here's a flash hole deburring tool and here's a primer pocket reamer. Those are just some tools. You don't have to have all these tools but these are some of the things I like to use. Obviously we're going to need a powder funnel. Um, right here in this little case and I don't know how good I'll be able to open it one-handed but there's a, a set of digital calipers and we'll we'll see those in a minute I have a flathead screwdriver a small crescent wrench and a small pair of channel locks a pen in case I need to write anything down on my paper and a nice flashlight make sure the batteries are charged and then it's a good bright one I like LEDs those work pretty well now I forgot to mention you need a reloading press today we're going to be using the RCBS partner this is a single stage reloading press it's great I've loaded tons of cartridges on it it's one of the cheapest ones that you can buy in fact uh, RCBS it's their bottom of the line press but man I'll tell you it works really well I've used it for things all the way up to 4570 handgun loads I mean I've used it for a ton of things right here I have some three-in-one oil and I'm just gonna put a little oil on the ram here um, you'll need some dyes we're gonna be using the RCBS 7.62 by 39 dyes now you'll notice it says 308.311-311 uh, I'll talk about that in a minute Inside there I also have a shell holder. Don't forget that because you need a shell holder to go into this groove on the press. You need some lubricant for your brass. This is lubricant that's made by Hornady. There's some one-shot lubricant. Dylan case lube that works good. And back behind is a can of pledge. In a pinch, in you know, if you don't have any other lube available, you can use pledge. I've used it before and it works great. Here's my Lyman Universal trimmer. I've already got it set for the appropriate uh, case trim length. We're going to be using that. I have a digital scale Frankfurt Arsenal and I also have an RCBS 502 scale. I'm going to be using those. I'm also looking at this Hornady lock and load AP powder measure. I'm going to be using that as well. So those are some of the items that you'll need to reload this cartridge. Here. I'm going to be pulling out uh, 20 rounds of brass from this tumbler. Now, as I'm pulling the brass out, I want to kind of look at the brass and I want to inspect it. And you notice that there's little dings on the side of the brass. This uh, 762 by 39 is a very violent action on some of these AK platforms and it beats the hell out of your brass. So you want to look for brass that doesn't have significant wear and tear on it. Stuff that's, you know, I've seen some that have huge dents in the side of them and I want to try to avoid that. Now some of them that do have these large dents in the side, that's okay. I mean we can deal with that. Um, those huge dents, when the case fires in the chamber, it'll fire form back to the original size. But you just want to make sure that there's no cracks or anything that's going to hurt the actual integrity of the case. Okay, the first step in the process is to take some of this Dillon case lube and take these brass cases and I'm going to just give them a few squirts and I'm not worried about the lube getting inside the case mouths or anything like that. 
just a few squirts and I'm just gonna set them aside and let them dry while they're drying I'm gonna be getting the case holder or should I say the shell holder from this set of dies and I'm gonna put the shell holder in the press now I wanna make sure that you understand that these shell holders do not come with most of your die sets now if you're buying Lee dies just make sure that you're that you have a shell holder make sure that you have the type of shell holder that has the little groove here on the bottom because there's other shell holders that are available and those are the ones for the Lee Auto Prime tool and you don't want to get them mixed up you need these type that slide in now I've got my shell holder installed in my parrot press I'm just going to take a little bit of 3-in-1 oil and just put a couple drops just to get a nice smooth operation out of my press here. A lot of people overlook this step. Just need a little oil so that things can operate nice and freely. It takes just a second and it goes a long way. There you can hear that nice and smooth. You don't want excessive oil but just enough. From here I'm going to take my decapping die and it's noted by the decapping pin. Now I want to stress that on this RCBS set it says 308 and then it says slash 311. Now what they're referring to is the expander ball. Let me take this die apart and I'll show you what I'm talking about the expander ball. This die set comes with two different expander balls. Okay, One of them is for 308 diameter bullets which I have in my hand here. I'm going to put that away and the other one which is already installed is for .311 diameter bullets. So this die set will use both sets of bullets and again since we're using the point three one zeros we need the applicable expander ball so now let's go ahead and put our die back together I'm gonna put the decapping pin in until it sticks out about three sixteenths of an inch or so you don't want it sticking out too hard and from there you just lock this small lock ring. Take a crescent wrench, lock this lock ring down. Now this die, the decapping die, is ready to be installed into the press because I have this depth correct. I'm going to raise the ram on the press all the way up and I'm going to thread the die down until the die body touches the shell holder. You can barely see the shell holder peeking through right there. So I'm just going to thread this down until you see it touch. Okay, you see the die body touching? Now I'm going to lower the shell holder just a little bit and I'm going to give the die body just a little bit of a bite. So I have a good connection there. From here, the die body is not going to move because I have the, the ram against it. I'm going to just go ahead and lock the die lock ring. Tighten it down. Doesn't have to be crazy tight. Just a little bit. And now we're ready for the decapping operation. The die is set. Okay, before I start the actual decapping, I need to put this cup onto the press. So let me take this camera off the tripod for a second. Hope I don't get too shaky on you. But I'm going to come around and I'm going to look and when when the ram is raised, the primers will fly out of that little hole right there. Okay? So when the primers come out of that hole, they need to go in into this cup. So I'm just going to put this cup right here. It connects right there on the side of the press. So as the ram comes up, the primers will spit out right into that cup. Okay, let's come back. Okay. 
and from here I have my little loading block I'm going to insert the case into the press raise the ram all the way up it'll knock out the old primer and it'll resize the outer dimensions of the case now as I lower the ram you'll feel like this little catch what that catch is is that's the expander ball and what it's doing is it's sizing the inside diameter of this case mouth to the to the proper dimension that's going to fit the three point the, excuse me the point three one zero diameter bullets. See, and it knocked out the old primer. So we've done on that first stroke. We've done three things. Again, we've decapped, meaning we've knocked out the old primer. We've resized the outer dimension of the case. And the last thing that we did was we resized the inner dimension of the case mouth. So I'm going to just compete, excuse me, complete the process on all of these rounds. There's a part of the primer. So again, I'm just decapping, resizing. and I'm setting them back on the loading block when I'm done at the other end of it. Now one thing I want to show you is another piece of brass over here. You see how this piece of brass up around the top it's got like a, a beveled area? What's happened here is this brass has been loaded before with a 308 diameter bullet and then it's been fired and so now watch what would happen if I was to decap this one it'll take some of that out not all of it but you see some of that rippling stuff kinda of took the majority of it out the see so that's if you come across any brass that looks like that that's probably what's happened it's probably been used for a 308 diameter bullet this round is very popular in in the aspect that it has it uses a lot of steel casings now steel casings you know they probably do that because they're they're designing it for the battlefield right well that's good but in a reloader sense if you're if you've got steel casings it's going to be hard to reload those things the point that I'm trying to make is when you look down inside the case if you see if you're looking straight down in the case and you see two little holes like that that's the that's the bird end prime and what will happen is if you put those on your reloading press and you try to decap them you'll break the decapping rod so make sure that the brass that you have has a single hole in the center and that'll be a boxer primed brass and therefore you won't have trouble trying to decap those you won't be worried about breaking a decapping pin see the one hole in the middle if that's the correct kind of brass if you have two holes it's not gonna work okay at this point I'm gonna take my little lead because you see the primer pockets kinda dirty I'm just gonna take my Lee primer pocket cleaner and I'm just gonna clean the primer pocket a little bit All this does is it gets rid of the carbon and the dirt and stuff that might have been in the primer pockets. Nothing too significant. It just makes it where they're a little bit better as far as being able to seat the primers uniform. Nothing too crazy. Okay, this next step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this deburring cutter into the case. 
and what it's going to do is it's going to clean the inside of the flash hole now what happens is when they manufacture this brass they run a punch through the bottom to punch out the flash holes and inside the case there's brass that's just kinda like real crazy inside and all this cutter does is it goes in and it removes all of those inconsistencies so it's a great tool to have it's not 100 percent necessary but it works good Okay, I'm finishing up my last flash hole deburring. Now, you can see on my cutter that there's a lot of brass that I removed from the cases. And there's a lot of brass inside of the cases themselves. I'm not worried about getting that brass out yet because I'm going to set up for my trimming step now. So, I'll clean those case mouths after I trim them basically what I have over here is I have a little collet and I'm gonna stick the case in and just kind of rotate it a little bit there's a pilot and there's different pilots that are corresponding to the different sizes of cases that you might want to trim now I've already got this trimmer set up so I'm gonna lock this case into place by rotating this away from me and now I'm gonna spin this arbor this cutter and I'm gonna push the cutter in towards the brass until this um, part of the cutter here touches the body of the trimmer this will trim the brass you see there's trimming a little bit now when it, when it bottoms out against the case uh, body of the trimmer again it's trimmed it can't go no further in so then therefore it would be trimmed to the appropriate length now again looking at our paper we want between 1.51 and 1.52 that's going to be our desired trim length so let's go ahead and measure and see where we're at now this trimmer should already be set up for a good measurement 1.525 and that's good because the book said 1.528 so that's good we're set from here I'm just gonna take the trimmed cases and I'm gonna set them to the opposite end you can tell the cases that have been trimmed versus the ones that have not been trimmed because they're much shinier around the case mouth. Another thing that you could do is you could deburr the outside of the case because when you trim you'll develop these small little burrs and they need to be removed. They're sharp. So you just take your little deburring tool as you go. I don't do anything inside the case mouth. Uh, you can. You can take a small amount of material out it's important not to remove a bunch of material so there's there you have it this is the trimming step again you put the case in you rotate the cutter until you fill it bottom out pull the case out you'll fill the little burrs and then just deburr the case when you're done set it in the loading block at the opposite end so that you know which ones you've done and which ones need to be done this is a great trimmer I really like it works good it's ah gosh I think I paid about 85 bucks for it or something like that when I bought it I'm just hoping that you guys get to see everything in the process here see it's nice and shiny around the case mouth definitely tell that it's been trimmed so I'm gonna go ahead and finish these the rest of these and I'll be back in a minute and there is the brass they were trimmed resized deprimed, primed all that the next step is going to be to prime those cases but before we do that we're gonna run a brush through the case mouths the reason I like to run the brush through the case mouths before I prime is because I don't want this metal tip coming in contact with the, one of the primers in the cases. So I'm just going to make a quick step here, taking all the gunk out of the cases. If you wanted to blow some air in the cases, you could if you have an air compressor. That's no problem at all doing that. Uh, just make sure 
that you're not accidentally putting moist air into the cases because once you prime them and powder them if there's any moisture inside it could really mess up your load so just be careful if you're going to be using air that your uh, air compressor is uh, dry air. I'm just going to make sure that each primer that I use has a anvil and that's the little Hot Wheels looking thing that you can see there in the center that's holding the primer compound. Now if you don't have an anvil what could happen to your case is when the firing pin hits the primer it does not make the primer go off because the priming compound doesn't come into contact with an anvil and so you have to have that now when you seat the primer you want to make sure that they're flush or just a little bit below flush so I'm just kinda of raising the ram lowering them down running my finger across filling them and seeing how they feel I'm just gonna prime these 20 cases I like priming on the press because it seems to have you know you get a lot of feel to the primer plus you have a lot of leverage mechanical leverage on your side makes the priming process a lot easier especially if you're starting to lose dexterity in your hands and things like that priming on the press definitely makes it nice so if you're an elder gentleman you know or lady for that matter <laughs> out there reloading and you don't have much dexterity you might consider priming on the press Grew. and you can see that I've zeroed up now I can take my bowl to my powder char dispenser and I can throw a charge now my powder dispenser my powder measure over here you can it's it's off camera but I've got it set to throw approximately 20 grains so when I put this on you can obviously see that it's way too heavy and that's because it's set for zero I have to go set it up for 20 grains now you can see next to the zero there is a series of small lines each one of these small lines represents five so when you get to this first large line that would be 25 so I need to go up to 20 which would mean I would need to go up to the fourth line just before that large line take my charge take another piece of brass and you notice I move them from one end of the loading block to the other end of the loading block and that tends to help me so that I don't forget what's charged and what's not charged let's weigh it now you really technically don't have to weigh every single charge I just you know I'm really funny about you know wanting to get consistency so I kinda I kinda like to do things that way I like to make sure everything's right on the money and the result is I have pretty good ammunition now let me show you another method that you can use to charge these cases okay right now I have a, a, a case in my hand it's not charged or anything I'm gonna set it on my scale and I'm gonna turn the scale on what will happen is the scale will zero itself to that case you notice it says zero now I'm gonna take this case up to my powder measure I'm gonna put a load into this case this case is now charged with powder and take that charged case back down to the scale set it down and let's see what kind of charge we have 19.9 so you can do that to charge your cases as well now be careful if you do that because if you you, you can see that there's a negative on there that's because it's missing the case if you put another case on there you might have a difference because these cases might be different in weight so you can zero your scale again right there see that my scale zeroed 
Again, we're going to charge again. One, two. Put it on there. 20.1. Set that on there. See, there's the difference because the brass is a little bit heavier. That brass is heavier than the last piece. So we're just hitting the tear button. It zeroes us up. Charge the case. That way you don't have to sit there and turn the scale on and off every time. Okay. When, when you're using your powder measure, try to be consistent about the stroke that you give that powder measure. If you're going to bump it on the upstroke, bump it every time. If you're not going to bump it, don't bump it. You know, you want to be consistent. So, the, see the cases, you can tell that they vary in weight. As long as we're between 20 and 22, we're good. But we're shooting for 20. You want to be sure of one thing also. Watch the scale here. Watch when I blow on it. Let's hit it to zero right there. Now watch when I blow air on it. You see some of the readings could go crazy. So you want to make sure that you don't have any fans in the area. Or anything like that because that could really jack up your your what you think you're throwing right over here I'm just looking down and I'm starting and I'm just starting with the top row and I'm going down and I'm just making sure that my powder levels are uniform if you see one that's real high or one that's real low you know you might want to stop take a look and see what the problem is weigh that charge make sure everything's cool because if it's not you could be setting a bullet on top of something that ain't uniform. You could have a case that's low, a low charge. You could have a case that's hot. So you just want to make sure that you don't run into those problems. So I've got my bullets here. I've got my charge cases here. I've got Spider-Man hanging out. And I'm going to put in my bullet seating die. But i got to remove my decapping and resizing die. I also can flip down my primer arm. Don't need that no more. So again I'm going to take this die out. And I'm going to insert my bullet seating die. Now this seating die, I have the seating stem backed all the way out, and I also have the die lock ring backed all the way out. I'm just going to start to thread it in. I'm going to take a lubed, excuse me, a charged case, putting the charged case into the shell holder, and I'm going to raise the ram all the way up. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to lower down the die body until I feel the die body touch the top of the case. From here, I feel it touch, right? So from here, once it touches the case, I'm just going to back it back about a half of a turn, and I'm going to lock the die lock ring. The purpose of backing it out half a turn is to remove the crimp feature from the die temporarily because all I'm concerned about right now is adjusting my die to set the bullet seating depth okay I hope I'm not confusing you here I've backed the die out now I'm gonna lower my die down my my uh, ram down and I'm gonna put a bullet into the case. I'm going to slowly raise the ram up. Nothing's going to happen because my bullet seating stem is backed all the way out. But from here I'm going to take my little screwdriver and I'm going to tighten the bullet seating stem downward until I feel it touch the bullet. Once I feel it touch the bullet, 
I'm going to lower the ram a little bit and I'm going to increase the bullet seating stem downward clockwise. Then I'll raise the ram again. What's going to happen here is I'm going to start to seat the bullet a little bit. See that? So we're just barely starting to seat the bullet. Now I want to look at the distance between the top of the case mouth here and the cantilure. And that distance is going to tell me what kind of adjustment that I need to make on my bullet seating stem, which I need to adjust that bullet seating stem. So I'm going to back my camera out here a little bit and I'm going to adjust my bullet seating stem. I'm just going to go clockwise a little bit, about a turn or two. One, two, and then now I'm going to raise the ram. That seats the bullet a little bit more. Let's take a look. See how we're getting closer? We're getting closer to the desired bullet seating depth. Now, we're still not quite there, so I got to make another adjustment. I'll go in about a turn, I'll raise the ram and it'll seat the bullet a little bit deeper. Now if we look at the bullet again, you can see that, whoops, excuse me, you can see that we're getting much closer to the desired length. At this point, it's important to get out our calipers and start measuring. Okay, so let me get this different angle here. So I've got the bullet seating stem all the way out. I'm going to get the bullet out of here. Actually, it looks like it's just a little bit long still. So let me make one small adjustment, about a half of a turn. Raise the ram, lower the ram. Let's see where we're at. Now we're starting to get onto the cantilever a little bit. So I need to check for my overall length, which is 2.20. Now we're going to measure. We're going to get my calipers, open them up. Whoops, sorry about that camera work there. And we're looking for 2.20. 2.22. So we're still just a hair long. I'm going to insert the case back into the press. Again, I'm coming up to my bullet seating stem and I'm going to go about a half of a turn. Now, this is crucial when you're doing the first bullet. The closer you get to the desired seating length, or should I say the desired overall length, the smaller the increments need to be on this bullet seating stem. Now, I seated the bullet a little bit deeper. Let's take another measurement. Again, we're looking for 2.20. 2.217 so we're just a little bit long put the bullet back in again a small adjustment on the bullet seating stem I went about an eighth of a turn seat the bullet we're getting closer we're looking for 2.20 2.20 7 so we got just about a sixteenth of a turn. One, I've already adjusted the bullet seating stem, raised the ram up, lower. Looks like we're right in the cantilever, real nice. Let's take a look at our measurement. 2.2025. Okay, we're very, very close. Put it in. I'm gonna go. Oh gosh. About a 30 seconds of a turn. When it comes to adjusting your bullet seating stem, again, you don't want to make too large of adjustments because if you do, it's kind of like cutting a board too short. Yeah, 219.8. We're just under. So we're, we're looking good on our bullet seating stem. You know, if you cut a board too short, it's just too short, so you don't want to do that. Okay, now, we have established the bullet seating depth on this round. Okay, now what we need to do 
is we need to come around this cantilever and we need to put a nice little roll crimp of the brass into the cantilever. What I mean by that is we want the brass to kind of bend in like that at the top into the cantilever. You know there's two types of crimps that you can use. There's a taper crimp which takes the brass like that and then there's a roll crimp. This die has a setting for a roll crimp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my die lock ring, I'm going to loosen it and I'm going to loosen the die body out. I'm also going to take the bullet seating stem all the way out. And you're probably sitting there wondering why are you taking the bullet seating stem out? You just did all that work to find your bullet seating depth. There's a reason because to establish a crimp what I need to do is I need to lower the die body down to establish that crimp and if I do that with the bullet seating stem where it currently was when I lower the die body it would seat the bullet deeper and I don't want to do that because I've already established the bullet seating depth that I wanted so from here I'm gonna raise the ram again and I'm gonna lower the die body down until I feel it touch the case mouth again Okay, so you feel it touch the case mouth. Once it touches the case mouth, I lower the ram a little bit and I go in about one eighth of a turn increments and I raise the ram. What this will do is this will start to crimp the cartridge. I inspect the cartridge for crimp. If it doesn't have enough, I rotate the die body another eighth of a turn. Then I crimp again. I inspect the cartridge again until I find the crimp that I like. You don't want to go too heavy on your crimp because if you do what could happen is you could crunch the whole case. So you don't want to do that. So there you can see that, that bullet has a nice little roll into it. And that's exactly what I want. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that bullet in there because I have the crimp that I want and I have the bullet seating depth that I want so from here it's important to set this die so I'm gonna come up here I'm gonna raise the ram up and I'm gonna tighten that'll lock the die from moving so that I can tighten the die lock ring now when I tighten the die lock ring into place <clears throat> I'm securing that crimp section of the die so that die is set to crimp now I need to come back to my bullet seating depth so I'm gonna lower my bullet seating stem down until I feel it touch the bullet once it touches the bullet you see you can feel it right there once it touches the bullet I lock the bullet seating stem lock nut this will give me the correct bullet seating depth and it will also give me the correct crimp. So now let's take a charged case. Now I'm going to scroll down because I don't need to look at the die no more. The die is set. Let's take a charged case, put it in the press. We're going to put a bullet in there. We're going to raise the ram. From here, let's take a look. We have the right crimp. We have the right depth. Let's double check our depth though. 2.20 is what we're looking for and we're 2.193. So we're good. From here, I'm going to go through all of these rounds, making sure that they're charged cases. I put them in the press and I raise the ram. And what happens is two things. I'm seating the bullet and I'm crimping the bullet all in one step. So I'm going to go ahead and finish these guys up. We're almost done. So now that die is working. It's doing two steps on each stroke. Crimp and bullet seating. And those bullets look great. So I'm going to finish these up and I'll be right back.
if you want to add a little bit more concentricity to your bullets here's a simple tip that you could use as you're seating the bullet you'll come down you'll come up with the stroke halfway seat a little bit and then turn the, the, the bullet 180 degrees and then seat it the rest of the way and this sometimes helps with concentricity well last step in this process that I like to do is I like to take just a rag and I like to clean off the bullets and make sure you know and again I'm inspecting them I'm checking for any kind of problems or anything that's wrong any kind of discrepancies cases failing uh, making sure my primers are seated bullet seating depth crimp all that stuff and I'm moving them to the other end once and once and again one more quick thing before I go this piece of paper that has all my data on this uh, round this goes with the bullets you know this round came out 1943 and it worked all the way up into the 1970s it was a very popular round and at the end of the 1970s it got replaced with the 5.54 by 39 so if you haven't seen that take a look that's an excellent bullet anyway again everybody thanks for watching have a beautiful day we'll see you next time <laughs> bye bye I'm gonna clean these up getting hungry too think I'm gonna go eat later